Thank you so much. We're going to do a few questions from up here and then leave some time, some ample amount of time for questions from the audience as well. Um, Chief Justice Jefferson, did you think about this issue before you decided to become a judge? I mean, do you think there is a self-selection process going on among potential judges? We talk about electing judges, um, and in Texas we do, but most judges in Texas come to the court through an appointment, and that's how I came. There was a vacancy on the Supreme Court of Texas, and when there's a vacancy there, the governor makes an appointment. Uh, and it's much easier to run. Uh, it's much easier, frankly, to raise money as an incumbent than to jump in the middle of a race and, and try to win, unless, and there's, there's an exception to this, unless you're taking advantage of uh, the political shift in tide. So in 2008 in uh, Dallas and Harris County, Harris County is a good example. There are more than, you know, think about this, you're a, you're a voter, not a lawyer, you're a teacher, m math teacher, and you walk into the, the ballot booth and vote for Obama, McCain, and Lieutenant Governor, et cetera. Then you turn to this section that has a list of judges and there are more than 40 names. Smith versus Jones, 331st District Court, Anderson versus Johnson, you know, uh, district courts, county courts, JPs, Justice of Peace. Uh, how do you know? And so what they do is uh, vote by party, many of them uh, straight ticket vote. They vote for McCain at the top or Obama and every judge of that political affiliation below. So that in Harris County, every judge that was contested, they were, they were Republican judges, every incumbent that was contested lost. And so November 2nd or whenever it was, you had a Republican-dominated courthouse. The next day, you have 40 new judges, except for three judges, Republicans who won. And they won, um, most people believe, because their opponents' names were ethnic-sounding names. Uh, that was, and there was no other good explanation for it. So I didn't, you know, I, I didn't think through this issue, but I knew it was easier for me to run, um, number one, as an incumbent, and number two, in Texas as a Republican. And if, had I decided to challenge uh, somebody in a, in a race, I would, you know, if, if politics were the most determinative factor, then I would pick a, a, a county where it looks like the demographics are shifting. A, a couple of the panelists, Mr. Potter and Professor Sample, um, addressed this briefly, but I'd like to delve a little bit more deeply into the issue of whether these kinds of reforms are inherently partisan issues. There's a group um, that's been out there, the American Justice Partnership, which is saying, um, hey, uh, if you uh, have a commission appointed uh, only of lawyers uh, to pick judges, that's just as bad potentially as, um, or damaging for democracy as, as um, the kind of system that exists in most states now. I wonder if this is a left-right issue or something very different. Well, I certainly don't think it's, it's inherently a partisan issue, uh, precisely for the, the, the reason just given. It, it, it depends on where the electorate is. And you have uh, some very Democratic states that elect judges. You have some very Republican states that elect judges. Uh, so in, in that sense, I don't think you can say that one party or the other benefits by uh, moving to a uh, non-election merit-based uh, system. I, I also personally don't think you can say that overall one side of the equation, wh whether it's labor or business, uh, benefits by an arms race in uh, judicial elections. You can see a particular case where if you can surprise the other side and dive in, you might be able to buy it that time, but then you see the swing and the reaction, and I think the report documents that as you know, two sides on, on many philosophical uh, debates in the courts then rev up the next time to, to beat it back. I, I think it is more fundamental. Justice O'Connor referred to you know, people saying, oh, the founding fathers wanted us to vote on everything. And I think there, the political reality is it's, if you phrase this as um, to, in, a, in an election involving voters, if it is phrased as they want to take your right to vote away from you and they want to select judges in some smoky back room where you have no say, it's very, very difficult to make that uh, appealing. So if anything, maybe it's more sort of a, a populist 
uh, uh, battleground. But you know, I, I, I think those are really arguments that are used tactically rather than uh, the, the result of a, a real partisan split on this issue. What do you think, Professor Sample? Uh, I, as is always a good bet, I always agree with Trevor. <laughs> uh, but I do think that the, the real dichotomy is not left versus right. It's uh, the grassroots and the rank and file versus the perceived elites. And in almost every state that would contemplate a move to uh, a merit appointment system from judicial elections, it involves a state constitutional amendment that has to go before the voters. And the truth is that even where voters don't exercise their right to vote in judicial elections, where roll off, voter roll off is very high, they consistently prove, and Nevada may be finally some evidence to the contrary, uh, but they have consistently proved to be very reluctant to give up their right to vote even when they don't ultimately exercise that. And even when, as Chief Justice Jefferson says, they don't know very much about most of the candidates right. involved. Mr. Caperton, you more than anybody at this table and maybe in the room have experienced the personal cost of this problem. I wonder what you see as the most sensible way forward. Well, I, I've come to this battle late. Everybody else has been fighting it for a while. But, um, and uh, when I, when, uh, uh, since I'm the first one, or the last one into the, into the pool, so to speak, I, um, uh, James and I have had discussions about this. I, I am firmly in the, in the Justice O'Connor uh, camp of we need merit, sele merit selection of, of judges. Uh, there is, uh, it, it is just, it's just too partisan. It's, um, and there's, there's just too much at stake. So I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's, that's the ultimate goal that we have to work for. Uh, West Virginia just adopted a, a pilot project for public financing, which is certainly a step, but uh, but they fell short. There was a the, the commission that was that was chaired by Justice O'Connor had several several good ideas that were rejected, and that, and I was I was sad to see that because it was such a lightning rod issue in the state. I felt like it was perfect time for for something else to be done, and it wasn't. So, um, but I'm I'm all for the merit selection of judges now, based on my personal experience. Thank you. I wonder, um, even if uh, public financing systems have been adopted in certain states like West Virginia and Wisconsin, um, how uh, groups that do not coordinate with campaigns can get around those kinds of issues. Um, I, it seems to me that's, a, that's a, a glaring issue for the way forward. Oh, I, I, speaking to me. Um, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's the, that is the big, um, that's the big $64,000 question is how do we stop the, the special interest financing? And, uh, and I truly don't see a way around that now. Uh, you know, uh, an individual like Don Blankenship, he's going to spend as much money as he possibly can to get the, get the judge elected that he wants elected. And there are other people like him out there. So that is, uh, that is the concern, and that is why I would love to see the merit-based uh, appointments to take that uh, out of the equation. Mr. Potter? I think there are a couple answers to that. One is disclosure. You need to know where that funding is coming from, and it can't just say Americans for a better country. You, know, you have to understand the, inter the economic interests, the litigants who are behind that particular financing, and I think it affects voters' perceptions of the race. Um, that's the first answer. The second answer, thanks to Mr. Caperton, is we have the Caperton decision. And so if you have a circumstance, and the, one of the interesting things which James and I have talked about is that uh, the Caperton decision and Justice Kennedy's writing, he, he refers somewhat interchangeably to the contributions in the case and the independent expenditures. In fact, the three million plus was technically an independent expenditure uh, because it wasn't given to the judge's campaign. It was spent on the, the ads to elect the judge. But clearly, Justice Kennedy, at least in the context of uh, judicial elections, saw it as effectively a contribution because the judge knew where it came from, the justice did, and would be influenced by it and therefore uh, had a conflict of interest. And I, and I think that standard uh, is the important standard coming out of the case and one uh, that, that is clearly going to be hard fought uh, across the, the country because if if that's the standard and people are going to have to recuse because they were the beneficiaries of those massive independent expenditures, uh, it makes the expenditures less useful. Indeed. I just want to add something to what Mr. Potter said, and I, I 
West Virginia has has passed laws now to to uh, I think restrict the, the amount of money that can be paid into a 527 and, and increase disclosure. In uh, in the in the uh, Benjamin election, uh, the I think the there was a the the. Uh, reporting period for 527s was July the 31st, and the next one was October the 31st. So what Mr. Blankenship did and what the 527 did is they waited until after July the 31st before they put one nickel into their 527M for the sake of our kids' campaign. So it wasn't until less than a week before the election that, the, that it became public knowledge that, uh, that, this, that this group had spent almost $3 million dollars to have Justice Benjamin elected, so it was. Um, those 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 things just have to change. They can't. That that uh, that just ruins us. Justice O'Connor talked about courts being the one safe place for people in a democracy to come and get a fair shake. Uh, Chief Justice Jefferson, uh, how concerned are you about public perception in that regard, and what are you as a judge doing about it? Well. Um, very concerned, obviously. Uh, you know, to the extent the public distrusts its judicial system, democracy is really at, at stake, and that's uh, that's no um, minor point. Um, we've got to be very careful about uh, how we resolve our uh, civil disputes. Uh, these are the kinds of disputes that, in other countries, lead to war and to battle. Um, they're the kind of disputes that uh, if, it's not, if there's not a fair and impartial uh, court system, it leads to corruption and it leads to influence beyond uh, what is uh, appropriate in, in a democracy. So we've got to take every step and, and that's one of the, so one of the major problems is um, when, you, when you conduct these polls and 70 or 80 percent of the people say uh, we believe that justice is bought that we won't have a fair trial when we walk into the courthouse. And that is you know, hugely disturbing. Um, I, I'm not one of those who think that, by, that generally that's the case, that that is the actual reality, even in a state like Texas, where we elect all of our judges and money is raised, et cetera. I mean, uh, I've, I've been in court as a lawyer and now on this side of the bench, and, and what I see happening on my court and others is a real attempt to get the law right. And of course you have ju judicial philosophies, but I, I, I don't think that there's much evidence uh, that a contribution uh, has influenced the result, but it sure is what the public uh, sees. And so what do you do about it? Well, you, you know, when I speak around, e e even during a campaign, uh, and I'm speaking to citizen groups, I'll tell them this is, uh, you, you don't know that you're electing your judges, let me tell you what it's, what it's like. Uh, and whether you know you need to talk to your legislators and, and decide whether this is a good thing or not, or whether reforms ought to happen. Um, I speak to it about it to the legislature, my state of the judiciary address, saying we need to move from this partisan election to a merit uh, retention-based system. Um, I, I form task forces. I've got a group now that's looking at are there reforms, even if we don't get the golden ring of a merit selection system. Uh, what reforms can we have in place for the system that we do have? Now, Texas in the mid-1990s adopted a Campaign Finance Act for judges where we uh, uh, have limits on uh, voluntary, there are voluntary limits on the amount of money that is contributed to our cam campaigns and the amount of money that we spend. And so when you see these charts, um, Alabama, you know, Texas, Illinois, uh, Texas is, it's millions, but it's not Alabama, it's not that high because we've got uh, limitation. Well, maybe there are things that you can do around the margin, but let me finally say this. Uh, money is, is a problem, and I don't like it. Uh, politics is uh, an issue, but it's, you know, unless you move to retention, merit base, you're not going to get money out of the system, and we're even seeing evidence now that money is coming back in when interest groups don't like, well, they, they say they don't like the way the judges voted. Often it is more not geared toward that social issue, but toward the business, the tort fights, you know, trial lawyers versus um, businesses, but they, they kind of hijack that issue. Uh, you won't get money out unless you kind of move in that direction. Uh, you probably never get uh, politics out, whether you're talking about appointment system, completely out. Um, that's, that's almost impossible to do. But one thing that you can do with this marriage system is really begin looking at the qualifications of the people who are